thank you for being here. I, I was amazed to learn that your first appearance after the 1619 Project was in the New York Times was in the Third Ward at Emancipation Park here in Houston. I'm amazed to know that too. I forgot. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for letting me call you Nicole. One of my favorite stories in your book took place in your high school class in Waterloo, Iowa. With your teacher, Ray Dial, when you discovered the year 1619. Would you please share that story? Absolutely. First of all, hello, Houston. <laughs> um, just thank you all for coming out tonight and for all of the amazing support that Houston and the state of Texas have shown the 1619 Project, despite your amazing leadership in the state. Um, <laughs> And really appreciate, especially I just want to shout out all of the really important work that the ACLU is doing to protect all of our rights right now. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, there was ever a time where we needed to understand why something like the 1619 Project exists. We could not have written the script better, right? Like everything that's happening in our society is why, why this has to exist. And I always do this. I kind of just take over, but I will answer your question. Um, is Nicholas Smith's mom? She is. Hello, Ms. Smith. <laughs> so Nicholas Smith is the illustrator of uh, the children's book for 1619, Born on the Water. And he is a native child of Houston. So thank you so much for being here and for raising your son to be such an amazing uh, artist, as he says. If you haven't seen the children's book, the illustrations are just amazing. OK, now to your question. OK, one more. Are there any educators? in the room tonight. Yes. Special, special, special shout out to all of the educators who are determined to teach the truth to our children, no matter what these folks in your state house are saying. Um, it just takes a tremendous amount of courage right now and stamina and resilience to do what you do. I know you are not as appreciated and respected as you deserve to be. Um, but as a public school kid, I, I just want you to know I appreciate you. My child is in public school. And now I will answer your question because <laughs> if it weren't for a public school educator, I wouldn't be on stage with you right now. I would have never known about the date 1619. Um, and so, you know, I, I grew up in Waterloo, Iowa. Yes, there are black people in Iowa. Um, <laughs> yes, most of us are related. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I, I grew up in a town that didn't have a huge black population, but it still had enough black people to segregate us. And so starting in the second grade, my parents enrolled me in a um, voluntary school desegregation program um, where black parents could opt to bust their kids out of their neighborhoods into white neighborhoods and white neighborhood schools. And so that's what my parents did. And starting in the second grade all the way until 12th grade, I was bused out of my neighborhood into white schools. And my high school offered a one semester black studies elective course called From the African American Experience. And it was taught by this educator named Mr. Ray Dow. If you um, have read the preface to the book, then you know I, I shout out Mr. Dow by name. Um, Mr. Dow was just this amazing uh, educator. He actually was a college professor. He taught college level black studies. And as you can imagine, in our high school, all of the black kids were bused in um, to a school that wasn't ours. And so we were often made to remember that this school did not belong to us. There were lots of racial tensions at my high school. So the administration had recruited Mr. Dow uh, to be a disciplinarian to us way we're black kids, right? They brought them in to, to get us together, but they didn't know they were importing the enemy, right? So, <laughs> so Mr. Dow was one of those radical black educators who, um, instead of trying to control us, he sought to liberate us. And he taught this class on black studies and he taught it at a college level because that's what he did. And when me and my friends um, decided to start this covert underground black newspaper, he was the teacher who would let us into the teacher's lounge after hours so we could print our paper. 
and when we led walkouts at the school because we, um, we were demanding better treatment and we believed that black studies should be a um, year-long course and that it shouldn't be an elective, that you shouldn't be able to elect to, into learning our history, he's the one who told us exactly how far we could go up to the line without getting expelled. Um, <laughs> And so he was the only black male educator I ever had. And in this class, you know, I, I often think about, uh, my favorite movie is Malcolm X. And I think about that moment when Malcolm X is in the jail cell. And uh, Elijah Muhammad comes to him on a vision, right? It's like a ray of light that comes into the cell. And he's transformed. His, his world is never the same. And that's what Mr. Dow's class did for me. So all of a sudden, in this three months, I'm learning more about black people in America and the globe than I'd learned my entire life. And um, it was in that class that I realized there's actually things you can learn about black people, right? Because what I think we don't understand, it, it is the known world. Um, for a child, what you know about your world is what adults have taught you or what you have gathered from television or movies or museums. And black people really didn't exist in that world, except we were enslaved <clears throat> and then Abraham Lincoln freed us, and then 100 years later, Dr. King gives a speech, and that's it, right? That's the whole story. And so you tend to then think, the reason they're not teaching you anything about black people is we must not have done that much worthy of, of teaching us about. And then here I am in this class. I know it's a long answer. Good, I love it. <laughs> He's going to get through three <laughs> questions on that list. Um, <laughs> So here I'm in this class and all of a sudden I'm being exposed to this whole world of knowledge that no one ever thought it was important enough for us to know. Um, so being the nerdy child I was, I started asking Mr. Dow to give me books to read on my own outside of class. Like this one class was not enough. And one of the books he gave me was a book called Before the Mayflower by uh, Lerone Bennett. And I took it home and I'm reading it at my dining room table and like 30 pages in I come across the date 1619. And I didn't know when I got the book what the title was evoking, which was saying, I, I thought before the Mayflower was talking about African history before we got to the United States. But in, on page 30 or so, he talks about this ship called the White Lion that lands in Virginia a year before the Mayflower lands at Plymouth Rock. And I was astounded, right, that we know every American child learns about the Mayflower. And yet, no one had ever taught us about the white lion that arrived a year earlier that I would argue had much more of an impact on the country um, that would be built. And so I realized at 15 years old, um, one, like the powerful symbolism of that date, of a lineage, of a black African lineage that went all the way back to the earliest days of, of the original colony, but also to the power of erasure. Because then I understood at 15, it wasn't that there wasn't knowledge to be had. It was that people had chosen not to teach us these things. So what else hadn't they taught us? So I became both really empowered to know there was all this knowledge I could, that there were books, that there was knowledge, uh, that there were contributions, but also really angry that I had spent most of my life feeling diminished, demeaned, erased, um, that maybe we were an inferior people in some ways because we didn't seem to have much of a history or much contributions, and that that had all been intentional. And then I understood why, because I became a completely incorrigible student after that, right? <laughs> so you realize, oh, they don't teach you this, because then you start to challenge. So I would go in my other courses and I challenge, like, why do we only get to read one black poet in my AP English course? Well, why aren't you talking about this in my social studies course? And, and it was just that one teacher who planted that seed um, and just showed me that there was a lineage to be known. So I've been obsessed with 1619. I mean, it was maybe five years ago that I was in high school. Um, <laughs> are y'all just going to disrespect me and laugh like that? Okay, <laughs> I got you. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, so for 30 years, okay, for 30 years, I've really, I've really been obsessed with the day 1619, both for um, just again, just the facts of it, that there was this history that had been erased, but also just the powerful symbolism of a people whose legacy um, outdates nearly everyone else um, who's here. What was that, a 20-minute uh, answer? Uh, beautiful. 
Well, I want to build on Randall's question about inspiration, and I want to switch to courage. Because in your book, you talk about Mr. Dial, as you just did. You talk about the, your father and the, the flag um, and what that meant to you as a child and, and in retrospect. Um, but to me, it takes a lot of courage to go before the New York Times like editorial board and go pitch something that I'm sure that they were not thinking of, and then to be able to turn it around like that, and then to take that project and make it into all the things that it's been. Where do you find the courage to, to do that? I mean, you have a book, you have a, a podcast, you've done lots of interviews. You have this project now that is debated at the highest levels and the ire of elected officials. How do you, how do you get up every morning and do all of those things? So I, I, I would not, I, I don't think it, what I do takes courage. Um, this is, I guess, you know, uh, the benefit of studying history is, is I study people who actually had to have courage to do their work, right? People who had no protections um, of the law, people who had no status in society, people who didn't work for powerful institutions like the New York Times, um, you know, the courage of my own grandmother who was born into a family of sharecroppers, and when my father was two years old, decided her children wouldn't pick cotton. And so with a fourth grade education, gets on a train with two children, a suitcase, and some cold fried chicken that her grandmother fried for her for the journey, and leaves the South determined to change the trajectory of her family. Like, that's courage, really. Um, if I were to describe what I have, it's probably audacity not to know better. <laughs> That works. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it does, you know, I, I, I will humbly say it does take a certain amount of audacity to go to the New York Times and say, let's take over an entire issue of the magazine and just talk about slavery. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of, like, one, I'm an Aries, so I really, you know, I don't, I don't know boundaries. And um, I, had, I, I had spent... I, are there students in here? Yes. Any students? So I think it's important for students to know, you know, I, I've been a journalist for 20 years, and I fought really hard to get in the position where I could go to the New York Times with confidence and say, we need to do this, and they would actually listen to me. That wasn't most of my career. You know, um, I, I often describe my career as being like Master P trying to sling mixtapes out the trunk, right? Like trying to <laughs> get, y'all probably don't even get that reference. It's okay, look it up. <laughs> Look it up, look it up. <laughs> but, you know, of, of having the same mind, same ambition, same ability to bring about stories, but not being in places that believed I could do it or believed that those stories were important. And by the time I pitched the 6019 project, I had won every accolade journalistically that they say you should win, except the Pulitzer. Um, so I had put myself in a position to be undeniable. Now, it doesn't mean they won't deny you. We saw what happened at UNC, we won't talk about that. Um, but I had done everything that I could to prove that you could do long form projects that are deeply historical about racism and the black experience and people would read them and care about them and they could win awards as well. So I, I didn't feel like, I, when I pitched the 1619 Project, I had no doubt that they would say yes. I really didn't. I knew, I didn't write it out, I didn't do a big, you know, formal proposal. I just went in to my bosses at our, at our meeting, our, we have a weekly ideas meeting, and I was like, do you know this year is the 400th anniversary of American slavery? No, of course not, right? Like, we all know 1619 now, but most people still didn't really know about it. And then I said, did you know American capitalism was founded on slavery? And I just started listing these things, and immediately, um, to their credit, my boss has said, let's, let's do it. And then it just got out of control. <laughs> if y'all clap after everything I say, you will be the most amazing audience <laughs> ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Houston is an amazingly friendly place. Houston girl. is a great city. Yeah. It is a great city. You, you've been touring America for almost a year since the project came out as a book. What have you learned? What, what about America, about people, the reaction mm. to your book? What's, what's new for you? That's a great question. Well, thank you. 
I've been interviewed many times, and after a while, you, you, you don't have any new questions that have been asked, so I appreciate that. You know, um, I've learned a couple of things. One, I, I would say what has been reinforced for me is that these politicians who are trying to ban books, who are trying to ban thought, who are uh, trying to say that our children can't handle a complicated history for a complicated nation, that they don't actually represent most Americans. Um, they have a big megaphone, they have a lot of power, but they don't represent most Americans. Uh, I think you know the 1619 Project should be for most Americans, deeply uncomfortable. It should be something that makes you think, what the hell did I learn, right? What, how can this be true? Why didn't I know any of this? But what I find is most people are grateful because they, what I hear again and again is, now things make sense. Like I've been, the history that we've been taught did not explain the country that we're in. And now I have a little bit better understanding of why the country operates like that. And I've had this experience with every type of American. I, I wrote this project um, for black people, right? I, I wrote this project for us to say, you will not continue to marginalize us in the story of the country we literally built. But I wrote it to all Americans. Because I don't care if you're an immigrant who got here yesterday, or your family goes back to the Mayflower, or you're indigenous and you people were the first people here. We all benefit from having a better understanding of the centrality of slavery and black people to the country. Because you can't separate those two. We, 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 we treat these as segregated histories, right? There's American history, and then there's the histories of other people. But it's one history. And you can't understand any of it if you're not braiding those histories together. So I think the thing I've learned the most is really the profound openness hmm. that Americans have. I've had 85-year-old white woman from Mississippi who has written to me and said, I lived my whole life and had no understanding. And she's in Mississippi, right? Like, it's a lot of history there. Um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you for opening my eyes to all that I didn't know. I, I was in Philadelphia and met with um, some high school students, and this high school is very heavily Southeast Asian. And a young lady said she read my essay um, and for the first time understood that so many of the freedoms she had came from black resistance. Um, the fact that her family was even able to immigrate came from black people's uh, ending the racist immigration policy that put quotas on black and brown immigrants from being able to come to the United States. And then they were able to come to a country where racial discrimination by law had been eliminated because of the black freedom struggle. And yet they hadn't been taught to ever think about that their stories could be connected to ours. Of course, part of your Americanization process is to distance yourself from black Americans as much as possible. So to see people of all different walks of life kind of making that connection and embracing um, seeing their country in a different way taught me that, well, it explains why there's so many attacks on the project, right? Because it, it taught me that Americans are actually really open to having a greater understanding of our country. And when they have that greater understanding, it transforms the policies that they're willing to support. Um, it helps them to see why we have inequality and that it's not because somehow black people are the only people in the history of the world who like shitty schools, who don't want safe neighborhoods, who don't care if their houses are nice, right? That there's, there's something that created this that, oh, I'm in a, Ooh, I forget sometimes I'm in a religious, <laughs> and I'm on the altar, oh Lord, okay. <laughs> Whoever the God is, forgive me. Um, <laughs> though probably of all the things that God, whoever you want to call him, has to worry about, it's probably not me cussing, so it's probably okay. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think that's, that's what I've learned is, when you, when you this was a deeply, we talked about this at the dinner. This was the hardest thing I've ever done, right? This history is painful. It is ugly. When you just see wave after wave after wave of atrocities that black people have had to bear for no reason, um, 
it was just extremely emotionally taxing. And then it, you do have to fight this like constant sense of rage, right? Or this, this belief that like, this country just doesn't give a damn about us, which may still be true, but, um, but then you see that there are just really millions of Americans who, if they knew better, if they were taught a more accurate history, something that really helped them understand society, um, that they would support efforts to make us a more equal country. But they're taught a history that actually allows them to be satisfied with the country that we have. Uh, and that's really, I think, why the attacks are coming. Because if we learn this different history, then we can see a vision for our country that doesn't have to be what it is right now. I agree, <laughs> um, but those attacks are exhausting. Mm -hmm. And the, what you've talked about, what your collaborators and the project all talk about is you know, the, the unrelenting, sometimes deadly work that black people contributed to making this country. Yes. Um, yet we're still called lazy. We didn't work to get anything. And I, I find there's no room for rest. So my question to you is how do you find rest and how do black people find permission to take rest without feeling guilty? Mm, mm, mm. I'm, you know I'm gonna give the worst answer on that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't rest. I, you know, <laughs> um, one I think I'm like a lot of black women in general where I feel like um, our communities are in danger like we are a literal firewall of democracy, like how, you know, when, when, when do we rest exactly? And it's not being like, um, you know, superwoman, except we are tasked, we are tasked with being superwomen, even if we're, if we're not. So I, I don't rest much. I mean, as you know, I was in DC on Monday, Denver yesterday, Houston today, I'll be in Chicago tomorrow, back to New York for two days and back on the road again. But I also just feel so incredibly blessed. I, I think about, um, you know, I, I, I talk about my grandmother. I talk about her a lot. I talk about my father. Uh, a woman who clearly had ambition, dreams, like any other human being, but was born into a society where she couldn't manifest any of them. She was born in 1926 in uh, the most thoroughly apartheid state in America, Greenwood, Mississippi. Um, mm -hmm. And so how can I, I just feel, if I have managed to create this thing um, that has the ability to, I would never have the hubris to say transform society, but can be one of the things that helps you're allowed to, to say that get now. us there, right? <laughs> then why would I rest right now, right? Like I, I'm doing what I have worked my whole life to be in a position to do. I'm doing what I am called to do. Um, so rest, you know. I'll be dead a long time. I'll be dead forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to me, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think a lot about rest. I think a lot about trying to, in this moment, do as much as I can while I can, while I have the attention of people um, who can material, cha materially change the lives, particularly of black Americans. And frankly, um, none of us should be resting right now because Look, our, our democracy, you know, we're told that we are the oldest continuing democracy in the world, but that's a lie if you study history. We've only had a, a, a really semblance of democracy in this country since 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So what that means is we actually have a very new democracy that has been contested um, from the moment we began to have representative democracy with the Voting Rights Act, it has always been contested. And we are in a state, I know I don't have to tell y'all, that is really ground zero for the efforts to subvert democracy and to um, ensure minority rule. So how can any of us rest? Because if we do in fact lose the very young democracy that we have, we know who will suffer the most. We know who's already suffering right now. Um, so rest has to come later. There, there's too much work to do um, to save our country. And black women should not have to be in the role of always saving our country. But <laughs> 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 what 
what choice do we have, right? If you, if you go back to the Combahee um, River Collective, and what do they say? If black women are free, then all people will be free because black women sit at the center of all oppression. So this is the work that we must do, and this is the work that I will do. And I know it's the work, the it's work I've chosen to do as well. Um, in the cold, several states, uh, some 30-something states, have banned books like the 1619 Project. What would you <laughs> like us to understand about that? Well, healthy societies don't ban books. Um, <clears throat> you can't call yourself the freest, greatest country in the world, and you're so afraid of contrary ideas that you have to make them illegal. If this were happening in Cuba or Saudi Arabia or China, we would know very well what to call it. But somehow we're accepting of what's happening here, right? I mean, again, look at Texas. 1619 Project is banned by name. Um, teachers are being removed. Educators are being removed. Students are being encouraged to report their educators. There is a school here named after a man who was enslaved, and they can't teach his book. So. This is the sign of a country that is losing democracy. And if you look at people like historian Timothy Snyder or the philosopher Jason Stanley, people who track what happens as a country is veering towards authoritarianism, the first thing they do is they come for books, they come for writers, they come for thinkers. And that's what we're seeing. Um, the First Amendment to our Constitution, the very first one, is a free press. Right? It is the ability to have freedom of speech. Now, our founders, I don't give them credit for a lot. I mean, they were largely enslavers, so. But in their divine wisdom, they did understand that you cannot have a healthy democracy if you cannot have the freedom to read and to think and to express yourself without the state abridging that. It's one thing for a parent to say, I don't think this is appropriate for my child. It's another thing to use the power of the state to restrict what can be taught and what can um, be expressed. And what's clear is if they had a better argument, they would make it, right? I mean, seriously, you, you ban ideas when you are afraid that you can't counter that idea on your own. So instead you say, we won't let you learn or discuss this at all. What is the purpose of a public education, right? It's to build citizens. It's to help you have an understanding of a world that's not the microcosm of your household or your little community. It is to challenge us. It is to expand our minds. And instead, they want to raise uh, children who are indoctrinated into this ideal of American exceptionalism that has to erase the truth of our history and talks about not wanting children to feel anguish. That was my entire K-12 experience, <laughs> right? Name the black or brown or the trans or queer child whose experience has not been to sit in the classroom and feel demeaned, to feel anguished, to feel left out. Um, so we have got to, we, we have to understand that the opposition, the people who are banning books, who are chasing books out of libraries, um, out of schools, they are extremely well organized, but they are not representative. So what are y'all going to do about it? Right? They're enacting these laws in your names, even though they are not representative of, of, of the people. Now, of all the awards I've won, though, I will say, having people like your great senator, I, I won't name him, but y'all know who I'm talking about, <laughs> right? And all these other politicians seeking to actually ban a work of American journalism. I said this last night, I'm a bad B, but I'm not that bad, right? Like, come on. <laughs> like, it, it. I could have never imagined when I published the 1619 Project that the president, former president of the United States, would castigate the project. Um, it's been mentioned in both of um, Donald Trump's impeachment trials. I still don't know why. <laughs> you know, um, Ted Cruz, during the confirmation hearing for the first uh, black woman Supreme Court justice, basically they forced her to disavow both me and the project as part of the confirmation process. Um, to think that a work of journalism could be that fearful, right? Um, to have all of these powerful men, mostly, but not just men, um, trying to malign it and ban it. Uh, 
what it tells you is the power of who gets to control our national memory and how we think about and conceive ourselves. Because at its root, the 1619 Project is a work of memory, right? It's trying to challenge this crafted collective memory we have of the United States as this unique nation, the freest country in the history of the world, the only country that puts in its founding documents universal equality, you know, some of the most famous words in the English language. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by the creator with inalienable rights, were written by a man who owned 200 human beings at the time he wrote those words. And so we have to learn a history that shaves all of that off. And that is to justify power, mm -hmm. to justify hierarchy, is to justify uh, the inequality that we see. And so that is why you see this type of power uh, coming up against the project. I've written about racial inequality for 20 years. None of them people cared about what I was doing when I was writing about school segregation and housing segregation and policing. But it's when I go to the core of how we collectively understand our country, that that is when the greatest power in this nation will come down against this project. And so I actually see that as my greatest uh, badge of honor, frankly. Um, yeah. Nicole, I wanted to follow up speaking about, you know, what are we going to do, the action. Uh, what's the situation here in Texas about book banning and, and how is the ACLU responding? So uh, you mentioned part of it already, so I'll be brief. but. The whole point behind this is not just to ban the books, it's to erase history and yes. to undermine power. And I think that that's the premise of all of that and we all need to understand that quite clearly. A book is just, it's just collateral damage in all of this. Um, but at the state level, SB 3, State Bill 3, or Senate Bill 3, bans the teaching of critical race theory and specifically mentions the 1619 project and talks about inculcating students and it's focused on K through 12. And then beyond that, we have at the local level what we often read happening in the suburbs of Houston and Dallas and even San Antonio now is state uh, school boards, our ISDs, our independent school districts, um, specifically banning books. And those book bans are often targeted at books that talk about the identities, histories, growing up experiences of people who identify as black, people who identify as LGBTQ, especially the T trans, and then people who identify as um, non-Christian religious experiences, including Jewish people. And all of those are meant to erase those histories, those identities, the narratives, the being able to have an experience that helps you to see yourself. Because if you see yourself and you know that you have power and access and can accomplish something, beginning with understanding your background, then you're unstoppable. And if the good way that people have found to stop you is to take that out of your bookshelf and to pro prohibit your teacher or someone in your school district from teaching you, then that's, that's what's happening right now. And so, as Nicole said, what are we going to do about it? I think that's the most important thing. Because when we talk about the state, it is very scary at the state. But this is happening in our backyards, in our school yes. districts. And you all probably pay taxes. And so everybody in this room, regardless of whether you have a student in K through 12, needs to speak up about it. Whether that's to a neighbor, or speaking up on social media, or showing up at the school board meeting. And when the legislative session starts, we're going to hear this all again, because it's not over. And we need to be ready for it. Um, at the ACLU of Texas, we have focused on book banning and have spe specifically targeted places like Grapevine Colleyville and places um, around, the, around the state on these issues. Uh, we fought hard to try to stop Senate Bill 1 and the House bill that was like it that would now prohibit critical race theory and the teaching of the 1619 Project. And our work won't stop. Part of working on free speech and freedom of expression is what we have always done and we will continue to do. And so I hope people here will stand with us to do that. And if, if I could just quickly add to that, most of the people, so I covered education for most of my career before the 1619 Project. And typical school board meeting, 
there's maybe five parents, right, who come to testify. And so those five parents, if they come every week, they actually have the power to shape what the school board does. They're not representative of the community. And in fact, what we know is that many of the people who are showing up at these uh, school board meetings and pressing for these bans to take place didn't even have kids in the school. Sometimes they weren't even necessarily from the community. And so it doesn't even take that much organizing on you all's behalf to counter what is happening um, at those school boards. They just need to see that there's also going to be pressure applied from here, and they will respond to that. Elected mm -hmm. officials, no offense, just really want to get reelected. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so much is driven by their desire to not do anything courageous. Not, I'm not saying all elected mm -hmm. officials, but many of them, it's about wanting to get reelected. And so, if they're only hearing from this segment of the population, that is who they're going to respond to. It's not enough to sit at home and write a Facebook post or talk to your girlfriend. You know, this is the time where we all must engage in the democratic process. We have hard fought rights, right? We know that our ancestors literally died for and we have to exercise them. We really do, the time for complacency, um, it's over. We just, we don't have the luxury of that right now. Do we want to leave our children a world worse than the ones that we had? Because that's what we're, that's what we're veering towards if we don't step up. So before you go on, Randall, I want to put a plug in because some of my colleagues from the ACLU of Texas are here and outside at the table. There is a handout that has information on um, students' rights and how to use a toolkit. And it specifically mentions how to sign up for things like um, going to a school board meeting. So to Nicole's point, it is extremely accessible and it matters so much and it will take a painful two hours out of an evening, but it is worth it. So please do it. <laughs> And I know Randall really wants to ask me another question, but I just have one more thing to say. <laughs> so what we're seeing right now um, is we are, we are in a period of racist progress. So if you read the second to the last essay in the book, it's an essay by Ibram X. Kendi, and it's called Progress. And it talks about how Americans are just obsessed with this notion of progress. And that's because we can say, you know, yeah, things were bad back then. We, we did a couple messed up things like enslaved people and committed genocide, but that was in the past. And things aren't where they're supposed to be right now, but we're always making progress, so things are going to get better in the future. And what that does, this idea that progress is inevitable, that we're always making racial progress, one, it's just not borne out by history, but then it alleviates us of the urgency to act right now. Because we can say, we're not as bad as we used to be. You're right, I'm not a slave, that's true, right? And we can say things are gonna get better in the future, so we're always making progress. But what he argues and what I believe is that we have racial progress and then we have racist progress. Mm -hmm. And we are clearly in a period of racist progress. So all of these anti-CRT laws, which every time we say that, we're actually furthering a propaganda campaign. The critical race theory was a propaganda campaign. Teachers who can't even, you know, know hold a, you know, they're holding like mock slave auction lessons in the classroom because they don't know how to teach slavery, are not teaching high level, graduate level, theoretical race theory in their classroom, right? And that's what CRT is. We know that. But it's effective because you see this rise, you can literally trace the rise of the mention of CRT on Fox News to after the Black Lives Matter protests. So 2020, we all collectively watch George Floyd, uh, a man from Houston get lynched on national television. And for this brief period of time, it seems like Americans are really finally putting together that it's not about a couple bad police officers, that there's something systemic happening here. That this is part of a 400 years legacy of systems that would lead this police officer to feel that even though he was being filmed, he could kill a man because he was black and nothing would happen. That that's not about an individual person, that's about a society. And so what I, I've spent a lot of time looking at the polling and like what was happening and the type of movement we saw of Americans who were going from thinking racism is, you know, it's, it's about some bad individuals um, to making the connection that we have a society that was structured to produce the results that it's producing. And the starkest number was at the height of the protests, about 44% of Republicans, self-identified Republicans, said that racism was a primary obstacle for black advancement. 
Now, if you know the conservative ideology, that is an astounding figure, that almost half of conservatives were saying it wasn't just individual black pathology or a few bad apples, but that there was something systemic that was keeping black Americans from um, advancing and having equality. That had to get an answer, right? There had to be a response. You can't have half a conservative saying that there is structural inequality that has to be dealt with. So that's when we begin to see this backlash. Because why does it matter, right? The narrative drives the policy. So if you believe we are a fundamentally equal society, that everyone has the same opportunities, but there's just certain groups who refuse to take advantage of those opportunities. And so black wealth, um, black incarceration, black out of wedlock birth, everything that they say is um, pathology, then you say, well, that's just because black people don't want to take advantage of this country. And so you pass punitive policy that supports that point of view. But if you start to think there's something bigger here, Wait, this is a 400-year-old system. There was architecture, right? The black neighborhood is like the black neighborhood because the federal government redlined the black neighborhood, right? If you, if you start to see those connections, then the policies you support are very different. Then you start to um, support policy that redistributes wealth. Then you start to um, support policy that leads to more equality, that is not focused on individuals but on structures. Well, power does not want that. So what you then have is after these Black Lives Matter protests, you begin to see Republicans who go to the original wedge issue in America, which has always been race. Every cross-racial class movement, right? Every movement where working people, where low-income people uh, tried to collaborate across class for their own material interests always gets broken up by race. Where white elites tell poor white people, you are not like them. You might not have a pot to piss in, but you're white and they're not. And it works every time. So we saw them begin to sow those seeds of, okay, these black folks, they just don't want equality. They want to take your heroes. They're pulling down your statues to, to your white heroes. They want to take your history. They want to tell your children that your children are racist. They want to take your country from you. They're replacing you. And that's how you break apart right, a cross-racial social movement is you go to that original wedge issue. And so that's why we're all talking about this, is you have a party now, a Republican party, that is saying pretty explicitly, we only believed in democracy when democracy was for white people. And if democracy is multiracial, we actually don't want democracy at all. And that's, what they're hap that's what's happening in Texas, right, where the, the hyper-gerrymandering, where you can win the majority of, of the votes, but not win the majority of the seats. Or where they say, if you don't vote the way we like, we should have the right to overturn those votes. That is a people who don't actually believe in democracy. And there's this great book, and then I'm sorry, I'm gonna let you get back to your question. <laughs> there's this great book called How Democracies Die, because most of what I'm reading right now is, I, I don't feel like the American press is rising to the moment. I think too much of our political coverage is being driven by people who've never lived at the margins of American society, so they actually think everything will be okay and it won't. And so I'm reading these books that give you like a checklist, like what are the things you see in a society when a society starts to lose democracy? And, and they write about this phrase that I'd never heard before, and they say that until 1965, America never had a democracy, we had an ethnocracy. An ethnocracy is a democracy for a single race of people. Mm. And that's what we had, right? So we had a democracy for white people, which means even if your political opponents win, you don't like it, you don't like their policies, but you believe they're legitimate opponents. You believe that they legitimately can lead the country even if you don't agree with them. But now we have a place in this country where they don't think that people of color can legitimately lead the country. They don't believe that. So now they're like, you're not legitimate. Even if you win all the votes, we don't consider you to be the legitimate uh, ruling people of this country, and so we will get rid of democracy. So that's really where we are. And we have to do as James Baldwin said. James Baldwin said, white people have to give up whiteness. Now, I know, you know, if Fox News is in here, I'm gonna be on Fox News saying white people can't be white and they have to be ashamed of being white. <laughs> But what he's saying is whiteness is a construct. It's not saying you have to be ashamed that your ancestors came from Europe. It's saying that whiteness was created as a power dynamic and a hierarchy in this country. And if you want to have equality, you have to give up the belief that certain people should be on top 
and others should not, and you were born into that legacy. That's what giving up whiteness is. And if we don't do it, we're going to lose the little bit of democracy that we have, and we're going to lose our country. And that's, that's my message. Sorry. I've been up so, since 3 a.m., so just you know, give me some grace, y'all. Well, can we, can we stay on the how democracies die for a second? Because yes. I, 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 as I have fair, know several people in the audience, and we have had many discussions about this book as well. Um, but as I mentioned before, and as you know, I worked in foreign policy, and this is a book that keeps coming up alongside yes. everything that's happening in America. And people who are in foreign policy are suddenly having to wake up and understand what the United States is about. Yes. Because when you're abroad, you have to be able to explain why are you defending and trying to protect human rights for everybody else when your police are killing people on national television. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I know that you've been speaking to more international audiences, and if I'm not mistaken, to the UN um, recently. Like, what do you tell people in the international space when, you're, when your audience is not Americans? How are, you, how are you talking about your work there, and what is your message to them? Hmm. So um, I'm mostly, when, I, when I'm speaking to international audience, I'm mostly speaking to people in the diaspora. So they clearly uh, see parallels. Um, mostly these are people who are also descendants of slavery, just not descendants of uh, slavery in the United States. And anybody who's ever had conversation with people abroad know that they can see us much more clearly yes. than we can see ourselves. Yes. And I often say, I mean, this is why I said if these book bans, uh, if these teacher purges, if these library purges were happening in one of the countries that we consider to be authoritarianism, we would not be confused at all about what's happening. So I'm always saying, write that story as if you're writing it about another country and see, does that sound democratic to you? Does that sound like a fair and free society to you? And that's how other countries see us. They can see with clarity because they haven't bought into the idea of American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. Right, like we, we use this idea of exceptionalism um, to justify a lot of crimes against humanity, to justify a lot of horrific things that are done in all of our names, and of course to justify things that we do right here in our own country. Um, the level of black people and other marginalized groups who get killed by police. Tell that story from Cuba, right? Tell that story from Cuba and see, do we not see it as part of a repressive regime, right, as, as a tool of social control? So I never have to explain my work um, to an audience abroad because they already have a better understanding of our country. The hardest work is helping Americans understand that we are exceptional, just not in ways that are good. <laughs> and it's not. You know, it's not saying there's nothing good about America. Of course there is. I think black people are the best thing about America, frankly. But it's saying this idea of exceptionalism then causes us to be in denialism, right? We were talking about this at dinner. We're the only Western industrialized country where whether you can go to the doctor or not when you're sick depends on if you have a job that decides it wants to offer you insurance. None of the other countries that we compare ourselves have to do that. We're the only Western industrialized country um, that doesn't have any form of childcare. So where mothers give birth and six weeks later, you have to go back to work or you're not gonna be able to pay your bills. Uh, we have the highest poverty rates of uh, the Western industrialized countries. We are one of the most unequal societies in the history of the world. We incarcerate more people in strict numbers, not per capita, than every other country in the world with the exception of China and Russia. Black Americans are 10% of the global incarcerated population. We are only 13% of the population of the United States, but 10% of the global incarcerated population. So we are exceptional, but not in the ways we would like to think. And if we faced up to our past, I mean, this is my whole argument. You can't believe you're a great and exceptional country and then say you're too weak to withstand the truth. That if you learn the truth, this great country will be destroyed. Some of us, have not had the luxury of pretending our country isn't exactly what it is. And that's been the people who have been the primary architects of the equality that we have so far. It's been the people who could see it most clearly, who have fought the hardest to make it live up to its ideals. So the work of the 1619 Project and all of the texts, the 60 decades of scholarship that it's based on, is about trying to force us to confront the reality of who we are 
so that we can build the country we already believe that we are. Some of the issues you just mentioned, the, the lack of health care and inequality and unfairness is due to Washington gridlock we have today in your book, I think, points out that the founding fathers, especially the southern ones, especially in Virginia, pushed to create a government with excessive checks and balances, yes. while other world democracies were created for more, that are more action oriented. Yes. So the first thing we should be clear on is we were not founded as a democracy. We were founded as a slaveholding republic. And we just have to be honest about that. Um, if a democracy means a government of the people, by the people, then the fact that when we were founded, the only people who could exercise the franchise were landed white men. So most white people couldn't vote, women couldn't vote. Black people were enslaved and indigenous people were not even considered part of the nation. So it is a, a, a very successful propaganda that we even think that we were founded to be a democracy. We were founded to be what they considered a representative republic, but we were a slaveholding republic. So as I argue um, in the opening essay of my book is we're all taught to think about uh, the kind of heart of American identity as the abolitionist North, right? Um, that the revolution, the heart of the revolution was Boston and Philadelphia. That's not true. The heart of the revolution was Virginia. Our country was largely shaped not by liberty loving um, people in the north, and by the way, all 13 colonies at the revolution engaged in slavery. There were no free colonies um, during the revolutionary period. But the heart of America was the slaveholding South. So the drafter of the Declaration of Independence, an enslaver from Virginia, the father of the Constitution, enslaver from Virginia, Bill of Rights, enslaver from Virginia, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death, enslaver from Virginia, first president, enslaver from Virginia, 10 of our first 12 presidents, enslavers, most of them from Virginia, majority of our Supreme Court, enslavers, majority of the Senate, enslavers, how do you have all of the most powerful people who are shaping the political, social, cultural institutions of a nation are enslavers, but somehow slavery has little to do with the country that was born? <laughs> Virginia was the oldest colony. It was the biggest colony. It was the most wealthy colony. It had the most political power. And 40% of the population of Virginia was enslaved. It was, as historian David Blight called, uh, the American South was one of just five slave societies in the history of the world. Five. Ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the Caribbean, South America, and the American South. So that we even think about kind of the heart of American identity as being Boston or Philadelphia, yes, the Declaration was written in Philadelphia by a Virginian who enslaved people who brought his property with him to keep him comfortable while he enslaved. So we have these tensions um, from the beginning of our country between how much of our country would be free, free labor, and how much of our country would be enslaved labor. But because of things like the Three-Fifth Compromise, um, which we all learn about, but not really, what the Three-Fifth Compromise said is that all of the slave states can count all of the enslaved people as three-fifths of a person for representation in Congress, which meant they got more seats in Congress than what their voting population would allow, which meant they got to architect a weak federal government because they were afraid that the federal government, if it was run by Northerners, would abolish or limit slavery. Right. So we are one of the few democracies, they, they call them veto points. Most democracies have one veto point. We have three. Right? Actually, we have four, including the Supreme Court. So in most countries, you have your legislature, and you have your executive, and that's your one veto point. But one of our houses of Congress can veto the other house of Congress, and the president can veto both of those houses of Congress. And the Supreme Court, which are unelected justices, nine people, as we all know, they just took away a fundamental constitutional right for women, um, they, can, they can overdo um, all of that. And so what it's saying is that, 
this legacy of slavery, this foundation, this need to set up a system of government that would not allow the federal government to have much control or power, that would allow different branches of government um, to stop any legislation moving forward was about stopping any legislation that was going to restrict slavery from moving forward. And so we all deal with that now. That's why we have a Congress, we have an executive branch, where even when you have all three branches under one political party, cannot pass legislation. That is a dysfunctional system. And it is another way that we are exceptional, but not in the ways we want to think. <laughs> so, I think we've got time for two or three more questions. I <laughs> not like with my answers, but OK. <laughs> uh, you can try it. We'll do a speed round. We're going to do a speed round. Very good. There's a great essay by Brian Stevenson in your book that points out that Germany had a meaningful reckoning with the Holocaust, while America hasn't reckoned with slavery. Yes. What could an American reckoning with slavery look like? So this is the answer that's going to get us to <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> so we also discussed this a little bit at dinner. Um, there's a primary difference between, I mean, there's many differences between Germany and the United States, but for, for this question, there's a primary difference. Um, Germanic history spans many, many centuries. Nazism um, was a very short period in the history of Germany. So after um, the World War II, Germany purged, right? There's no buildings with Nazi names on them. There's no statues with Nazi names on them. They were able, they really said, this is abhorrent, and we have to purge this from kind of, we're not going to um, build monuments or, or allow Nazis to be on any buildings. Um, and we are going to condemn this part of our history. It is a shameful part of our history that we have to disavow. So just based on the little Virginia history lesson that I gave y'all, how do you do that in America? Right? How do you say, OK, we're going to reconcile with slavery, so we need to remove all the names of enslavers from our buildings. We need to take down monuments to enslavers. We need to purge them as the good guys in the American story. because. What would you have left? I mean, truthfully, who's on your money, right? How, are we not going to name buildings after George Washington? Are we not going to name buildings after Thomas Jefferson, after James Madison? Um, are we going to purge our kind of collective identity? Because you don't have an American history without slavery. The first. I know. I, do we clap for that? Man, a little bit. <laughs> uh, I know why you were clapping. I know. So the first English colonists landed Jamestown in 1607. And 12 years later, we have begun African slavery. And so much of our society will be built around this institution that it is impossible um, to purge it from our collective memory in our society and to say, that was bad. We're not going to put those people up on a pedestal because we would have to purge most of our founders. And that makes us very different than Germany. And the other key difference is because of the Holocaust, there's very few Jewish people in Germany. So Germans could deal with a reconciliation without having to look every day and share space with the people that they did this to. But in America, we're the grimmest reminder of all of this country's failings. Every time you see us, you have to confront your hypocrisy. So what we've done then is to say, it wasn't that bad. It was a long time ago. Why do you have to talk about the fact that Thomas Jefferson made his living off of owning human beings? Let's just look at the beautiful words that he wrote. We have to treat it as marginal because we cannot deal with the hypocrisy of our founding. There were many countries that practiced slavery. <clears throat> But there was only one that practiced slavery, saying it was founded on ideals of God-given rights and liberty. And because of that, because of that grave hypocrisy, we have spent centuries covering up the lie. And that's why you see the bans, is because they actually believe the foundation of this country is very weak. They cannot confront the truth of who we are. And I don't argue you know, that any white person has to feel bad about something that they didn't do. Now, you can feel bad about shit you're doing right now. Uh, <laughs> 
But it's not about feeling bad about things or taking, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. We should feel bad that we were a country founded on slavery. We should feel deep sense of shame about uh, the hypocrisy and the, and the human atrocities that were committed. Um, but the way we learn the history is basically like, you know, we were the same as Irish immigrants or something. Like, everyone suffered as if slavery was not a unique atrocity in the history of the world, particularly chattel slavery. So we don't have to be personally responsible for the past, but we are responsible about how we deal with that past. And the same people who say, well, my ancestors never owned slaves. Your ancestors didn't sign the Declaration of Independence either, but you claim that shit, right? Like, you can't. <laughs> we, want, we want the collective glory, but not the collective shame. And so Germans have been able to deal with a history that is a narrow slice of their history, where the people that they tried to exterminate are not a significant part of the society, and where they can say, this is not who we are. This is just, you know. It was a really bad blip. But we have to say, this is who we are. All, so many of our great men, this is who we are. And that is a very, very hard thing um, for us to come to terms with. And so we don't. And instead, um, we just continue to, to believe the same collective lie. And then we get something like January 6th, right? Like, our inability to deal with the country we are, not the country we pretend to be, leads to the type of tensions and polarization um, that, are, that our society is struggling against right now. I think we have time for two more questions. One, Ani, <laughs> go ahead and then I think I can I mean, he's the boss. So. Well, well, I can combine my questions then. Okay. So one, you have a daughter, so how do you explain George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and, <clears throat> and the police to your daughter. And then my follow on would be um, to talk a little bit about your book, Born on the Water. Because okay. when, I, when I think of just the opening and the assignment, so in the book, it starts with an assignment of a little girl having to tell her like, family tree, essentially, and can go back three generations. For if, for if you are a black American who is a descendant of slaves, this is a very common um, experience because you can tell about your grandparents, maybe your great grandparents. I had an aunt that I knew was her parents were born into slavery, um, and she was very old. But like, you don't. You, there are no documents that help you really document all the pieces beyond that. Right. Um, so how did you? I felt like you were writing the book for me, for my <laughs> children, for every teacher I've ever had. But who were you really writing to when you wrote that? I was. I mean, that, that is who I was writing to. So Born on the Water, I describe it as an origin story for black American descendants of slavery. And I wrote it because um, I was that little girl who got that assignment of being tasked with it, um, you know, writing a report on your native country and drawing your native flag and being the black kid in the class who's like, what do I do? And then all these years later, when I had my own daughter, um, who is a New York City public school student, uh, she goes to a mostly black school, but our black population in New York is very diverse. So um, when they got that assignment in their class, her classmates were drawing the flag of Trinidad, or the flag of Jamaica, or the flag of the Dominican Republic. And my child is like, what do I draw? Um, and it's just one more time where you feel a distance between yourself and, and the rest of, of the people who live in your country and where you feel like we don't have a history, right? Like we're taught that our history begins with slavery when clearly it doesn't and there's nothing shameful about that history but our history doesn't begin in slavery. So I wrote that book to give us an origin story and so the book um, has the girl come home and tell her grandmother that she got this assignment and she was ashamed because she didn't know what to do. And her grandmother sat her down and told her um, about her people who uh, came from Angola, which were the first Africans who were sold um, into Point Comfort, Virginia, came from Angola. And uh, the full third of the book takes place on the continent because you shouldn't have to do this, but when you're black, it's like you just have to let people know we're human like everyone else. Of course we had knowledge and learning and relationships and science and skills. Of course we had all of that, but we're not taught about that. Um, and then it traces the Middle Passage, um, 
Nicholas Smith, who is, uh, again, the illustrator. Like, we don't pull punches in the book. Um, part of it is really hard and really dark, but that's our story. And then it talks about how when we came here, we built a new people and how we became the, the perfectors of this democracy. And it ends with the little girl. Um, I mean, it's my essay. I end my, my democracy essay on that. The little girl going back to school and drawing the American flag because that's her country and that's the country that her ancestors built and the country that she will build too. So that's who this is for, is for every black American uh, descendant of slavery who felt like we didn't have an origin story or that our origin story wasn't as good or powerful as anyone else, um, that we do have a right to claim the country that we built. And so that's, that's why I wrote that book. And thank you. I'm still not flying the flag in my, in my yard, but <laughs> we have a right to claim it, for sure. My last, our last question, uh, what are your hopes for the 1619 Project, Nicole, the response to your book, your hope for America? I know you, you've got, got a movie deal coming up, a series that sounds exciting. Uh, what are you hoping for the response for your book and for America? So um, we are, we're in production right now on the 1619 documentary series. It's a six part series that if you listen to the podcast, similar, every um, episode is an essay from the book. Um, and it's supposed to come out sometime early next year on Hulu and then air on uh, ABC, the network. Um, but my largest hope for the project is reparations. Um, The final essay in the book is called Justice. And what I argue in the book is if you read the book from start to finish with an open mind, there's only one conclusion that you can come to, which is that this country owes the descendants of American slavery a great debt. It is a moral debt, but it's also a financial debt. Um, we're taught to think of slavery as a racist institution. And we like to think about that way because it's somewhat comforting. Because then we can say, well, we passed all those civil rights laws in the 1960s, so you all have equality. We have ended racism in the law. That is all this country is required to do. But slavery was an economic system. You don't transport 13 million human beings across the Atlantic just because you don't like black people. You transport 13 million people across the Atlantic because you want exploitable labor. And that is what they did. And then they create racism to justify the exploitation. Right? How do you treat people like they're property? You have to say they're not human like you. But this was an economic system. It was an economic system designed to extract wealth from black bodies and redistribute that wealth to white institutions and to white Americans, as was what we benignly call Jim Crow. The 100 years that follow the end of slavery it was 100 years of violently enforced racial apartheid. We don't like to use that term here, but if you look up the definition of apartheid, that's what it was. And that was designed to keep an exploitable class of labor as close to slavery as possible, to not allow black people uh, to get an education that would allow them to compete economically with white people, to force black people to stay on the plantation or in menial labor jobs, uh, to maintain the economic hierarchy. So we should then be unsurprised that since none of the civil rights laws dealt with the 200, 350 year economic head start that white Americans have, that black Americans still uh, have the lowest wealth of all racial groups. And in fact, um, the wealth gap between black and white Americans has remained unchanged since the time the King was assassinated. So we get all of these legal rights, but as Dr. King said, what's the good of being able to go to the restaurant if you can't afford the hamburger? And that's where black people are financially. So, this is always like the gut check moment for me, right? People who come see me are self-selecting audience. Um, probably have a Black Lives Matter sign in your yard, support, <laughs> right? Say that you support equality, but then when I say reparations, the, the pearls get clutched all of a sudden. People <laughs> feel some type of way about it. And I think we really, really, really need to ask ourselves why. The majority of white Democrats, so these are the people who ostensibly are our allies, are opposed to reparations. Even though we know black people have never had a fair chance economically in this society, we know that wealth is accumulated over time, that 
we can have a great deal of control over our income, but very little control over wealth that we were not allowed to create through federal, local, state, and private policy. So why would we not want to alleviate the forced wealth, poverty, and suffering of 13% of our population um, when we can do it? One thing the pandemic taught us, we can print money overnight if we want to. Yeah. $3 trillion, I don't know where it came from, but they found it, right? And the last thing, see, I see you over here uncomfortable, so I want to hear no, what you I, have to I, say. I, the, last, uh, the last thing I'll say quickly on that, we can, we can pass a reparations program and alleviate the lack of wealth that black Americans have. Most black people will never be killed by the police. But nearly all of us have a lack of wealth that doesn't allow us, if we have a single financial issue, right? If we have a medical bill, if we lose our job, we go from middle class to poverty instantly. And it's not because we're not working, because income stops as soon as your job stops. Wealth is something that stacks and accumulates over time. That is the buffer. That's what allows you to send your children to school without debt. It's what allows you to buy a home. Black people have been denied access to all of that. So we can have a reparations program and still pass every anti-poverty program that we need to. I believe in helping poor people no matter what their race is. So we can have universal health care. We can have a universal basic income. We can have universal child care. We can do all of those things. But that is distinct from reparations and the specific harm that black people face no matter what their income is. So that is my biggest hope, is that we can take reparations from being treated as a fringe political issue to being the very linchpin of any type of justice or reconciliation around slavery. Forward, uh... I got curious when I read that chapter and I looked up examples of American reparations, yes. and President Reagan signed a, a reparation bill and, and, and uh, an apology for the Japanese who were illegally in, interned yes. in World War II. My Indian tribe, uh, their homeland was stolen. They got reparations in the form of land. Yes. Uh, 1906, my, my cousin still has 140 acres. So there are some sensible examples. Yes. We, we believe in reparations for everybody but black people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, so the beauty of having studied something for as long as I have is I wrote that essay against every single argument I've seen about reparations. I literally structured around everything that I've heard. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? So then I get data, and I refute every argument. Um, and namely the one that nobody's alive today who was enslaved. Well, guess what? People who were enslaved tried to get reparations. And they had to go to the same white supremacist government that had allowed them to be in slavery in the first place and then say, you should pay us for the slavery that you forced upon us. And we're somehow surprised that that government didn't listen, right? And we have people in this room right now who are victims of racial apartheid. I mean, I'm 46 years old, and 10 years before I was born, it was legal to discriminate against descendants of slavery in every aspect of American life. Housing, school, employment, public facilities. A decade before I was born. I'm not that old. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm using face creams, but I'm not that old. <laughs> so we have to understand that the same way that wealth is accumulated over time, so is debt. And failure to pay the debt does not alleviate that the debt is still owed. Mm -hmm. And the reason that black people are in the condition that they're in is not because they're black. Black is a fiction. Black was made up, right? Black is a category that was made up. That's why you can see someone as light-skinned as I am and still be called black, because it is a category that was made up to order our social and economic relations. We are in the condition we are in because we descend from American slavery. And so all of these policies that were enacted were to control and to maintain as close to possible quasi-slavery for the descendants of slavery. And so that is why reparations is owed to the descendants of slavery, because our conditions are because we are descendants of slavery. Now, if anybody wants to send me personal reparations, I'll give my cash <laughs> app out. <laughs> just kidding, Fox News, just kidding. Nicole, <laughs> sign books. Uh, please uh, go out in the same way you came in. 
And uh, Annie Blair, Nicole Hannah Jones, thank you for a beautiful evening. Thank, thank you. you. Here's our gift to you. Oh, that's awesome. I thought you were just looking at the time. <laughs> oh, we like to say it's our time. Y'all have been amazing. Thank you. Thank you.